so everybody here on United People's TV, you know what I think about the Glazers. You know what I think about Ed Woodward and the whole muddle of mess. Puddle of mess? Whatever you want to call it. Manchester United's owners and Ed Woodward. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to speak. It's quite, it should be an interesting video, this one. I'm going to speak to David Lyons, who is the author of this, which is Alex, which is the latest up-to-date biography of Sir Alex Ferguson that goes past him retiring in 2013, the whole way through to 2021, and what happened with Woodward and Moyes and Van Hal and Mourinho and Solskjaer. There's a ton of sort of like the untold stories here about Fergie and what went on behind the scenes. So, David, uh, I suppose before we get this interview started, uh, I suppose you can introduce yourself to, to the viewers and uh, sort of why you ended up writing this book. Cheers. Uh, thanks, Sam. Yeah, I'm... A it even says it there on the bottom there, David Lyons. Uh, I was a, a football journalist for 15 years um, until I got my first publishing deal in, in 2018. But, you know, I was writing fiction stuff, uh, but through that, uh, as I was uh, writing my books, the idea of finding out what happened to Ferguson or what Ferguson's thoughts were in his posts, you know, in his retirement years really fascinated me. Um so I started to find out some stories, sort of got into his inner circle to see, um, you know, what his thoughts were on David Moyes and Van Gaal and Mourinho and Solskjaer always interested me. And just because I was going to write a good article on it. Uh, and then I just thought as I was getting to it and as, when the pandemic hit, Sam, that um, this probably needs to be a book. There was just there was too much juice within it. Too much juice. Too much juice. Well, that's that's a good that's a good start to the interview. That's what you want. You want juice. Well, actually, no, you don't really want juice. You just want titles. You don't want drama. You don't want any of that. <laughs> but unfortunately, United are full of uh, full of juice, if you want to call it that. Yeah, but, more juice uh, than titles at the moment. Yeah, unfortunately, that's that's the best way to describe it. But so so what we'll do in this uh, in this chat is we'll speak about um, Fergie back in the day when the Glazers took over his relationship with. Uh, JP McManus and obviously John Magnier, the Rock of Gibraltar, the horse that sort of was at the centre of everything with. Fergie's collapse with the relationship with McManus. If you don't know about that, trust me, you need to know that story because it's really important to understand how the Glazers took hold of United. And then we're going to speak about those eight years under Fergie with the Glazers. And then we're going to speak about Moyes, about Mourinho, about Van Hout. It should be quite a fascinating interview. So thanks for your time today, David. But thank you. before we speak about all of that, I kind of want to fast forward to 2021. And obviously, Ralph Ragnick is Manchester United's interim manager at the moment. As far as you know, from penetrating Fergie's inner circle, not like that. I shouldn't use the word penetrating. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, that's a bad choice of word. Certainly not all in inner circle. Uh, no, not that, not, not that inner circle. But um, <laughs> was, was Fergie involved uh, in any way, shape or form in Ralph's appointment, as, as far as you know? Uh, with Ralph's appointment, th this, that appointment basically came down to John Murtaugh. Um, so when the, the, the plan was obviously not to sack Solskjaer at all, yeah. and Ferguson had played a big role in, in Solskjaer becoming Manchester United manager, uh, both on an interim basis as he did at the end of 2018 and then getting the, the permanent gig. But, um, what they would have loving back in 2018 was Mauricio Pochettino and, from what I believe, Maurizio Pochettino is still what would have been who would have been assumed to be the next manager after Solskjaer. But because he it was mid-season and he was doing a dub job at PSG, I think they were 13 points clear at the top of yeah. Ligue 1 when Rania, or when Solskjaer was let go, it was assumed that they'd bring somebody in for six months to appoint Pochettino in the summer. Mm -hmm. But that may not well be the case now. Uh, Sam, because it's believed that Ranić made such an impression on the United board when he interviewed for the interim job that, as we all know now, he also managed to buy himself an extra two years as a, in, as a consultant at the football club. Yeah. So Ranić may, I don't know now, um, I'm definitely generalising here and, and probably guessing, but I think Ranić's input into who becomes the next Man United manager may mean that it's not definitely Pochettino, which is what who Alex would have liked him. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of what we're hearing as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, Pochettino is a man we've been linked with on like three separate occasions, I think now, and it's just yeah. not worked out. So from a personal choice, 
I want it to be Eric Ten Hag, uh, but I suppose we'll see. And uh, apparently Rangnick is now being considered it's because of his recent form. It feels like United doing a Solskjaer V2 and saying, oh, he's doing well. Let's <laughs> yeah. give him the contracts. And I'm, I'm, I want to pump the brakes on that, but we'll speak about that in a different video. But yeah. what I want to do now is is sort of rewind a little bit to really help fans understand what went on back in 2004, 2005 between John Magnier and JP McManus. So for United fans that don't know, they were two of the majority shareholders at Manchester United, as far as I remember and know. Um, and they were also horse owners. And Fergie uh, went in to a part ownership, I believe, of Rock of Gibraltar. So if, if you want to, David, can you sort of explain that story uh, nice and tightly uh, so that people can understand how did the Glazers even all of a sudden own 98% of Manchester United? Well, interestingly, or probably not, um, <laughs> the bullseye of that story, um, nobody knows. Sam, that's the truth, is because it all comes down to a a legal spat that was settled outside the courts that nobody's been given the information to. Now, that legal spat was over the fact that uh, McManus and Magnier had become really close with Sir Alex. They, at the, this time, around 2004, 2005, owned about a 30% share in Manchester United. Um, incidentally, an, another group who owned the thirty percent share at that time were the Glazer family. Yep, uh, it was on. It was uh, PLC, so it was the uh, makeup of the club was um, lots of different shares, but they were the two majority shareholders at that time. Um, Magnier and Mike Manus gave Sir Alex. Now, this is where I mean we don't know, but this is where yep. the legal line is drawn. They had a conversation with Ferguson where he believes they offered him 50% share of a brilliant racehorse called Rock of Gibraltar, who went on to break loads of records. Yep. Um, so Alex's belief is that they offered him 50% of the horse. Um, Mac Magnier and McManus believe that conversation was that Sir Alex was to be given 50% of any winnings that the horse would earn. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where the difference of opinion was. Um, what happened was, at one point, a few years later, Alex wanted to cash in on his share of Rock of Gibraltar. Uh, again, can't, we can't talk about this in too much detail or in specifics because it, nobody can it's talk about it. It's a mystery. But they settled out of court. Uh, well, what happened was, f when Ferguson went to sell his share of the horse, he was like, no, you, you don't own 50% of the share price of the horse. We were just giving you 50% of the winnings of the horse to Ferguson bringing them to court to try and get his 50%. It was settled out of court. Yeah. We don't know how or why. Um, but what happened then was they had fallen out as friends and it allowed them, or we don't know how much exactly their fallout with Ferguson meant they sold their, began to sell their shares in Manchester United. But suddenly who was there to buy them? The other majority shareholder, the Glazer family. I mean, it, I mean, if if it wasn't if there if it wasn't that relationship and the breakdown of it that caused it, it was a mighty coincidence that it happened all around the same time. It, it, it was happening around the same time. The Glazers were acquiring more and more anyway, but suddenly when that thirty percent from Coolmore Studios or is yep. what um, Magnia McManus's holdings was called, when they acquired those thirty percent, well, then suddenly they were in control because they mm. went from thirty, they went from sort of buying up. 10 15 you know they were they were inching their way up the percentages and they were at 30 when they got the cool more estate yeah 30 percent, and suddenly they were in control sam and it just it, it, having 60 percent allowed them to buy it more and more and more and suddenly they had 98 percent. and by 2005 may 2005 that the extra two percent had to be forced into the hands and now they are the sole owners of manchester united uh we all don't we all know that and um David, what I want to ask here is, for for a lot of Manchester United fans, uh, we'll, we'll 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 talk into it in a little bit more detail as the conversation progresses. But Fergie's silence on this whole situation has been uh, pretty powerful in the wrong way because when Fergie when they took over, uh, you were explaining in the book that uh, Fergie was looking at the list of potential new owners that it could have been. I remember at the time, I'm not sure if it was just before, but that was when um, what's his face Sky, I can't remember his name. 
Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch and the failed bid from Sky to buy Manchester United. Yeah. Uh, that was sort of happening in and around the same sort of time. And Fergie felt that the Glazers were the best owners for the club. Whereas the sort of impression I'm getting from reading your book is that I think sort of Fergie might have felt that the Glazers were the best owners for Fergie because it would it gave him that autonomy, 100% control over the footballing side of things. Is, yeah. is is that the impression that you've got from, you know, from speaking to Albert Morgan and whoever else you spoke to inside Fergie's circle that he really was fine and happy with the Glazers being owners of United, even though they leveraged such a huge amount of debt onto a club that prior to that didn't have any debt? Well, you don't, I think you've you've hit the nail on the head in some way. Is Ferguson is, was very silent on the subject, but he liked having the Glazers as Manchester United's owners. Because suddenly he went from a guy who was, you know, battling with owners like Willie Moorhead and uh, Donald Aberdeen. You know, these guys he was having verbal shouting matches with. And, and Mark, even Martin Edwards, who was Man his boss at Manchester United for decades, they always butt heads. And the idea that the Glazers weren't even in Manchester hmm. and were willing to... He met with Joe... Uh, Glazer very early on after the buyout and realised that the Glazers wanted to exercise the commercial arm of Manchester United, which they did. They brought it from give me this right, 170 million a year United were turning over in 2005 before they took over to when Ferguson retired in 2013 it was nearly 500 million a year. Yeah. So the, the, the revenues, they knew what they were doing and, and, and it explains in the book actually how Edward would um, <laughs> I know you're not his biggest fan, Sam. How he, how he went about that. Um, but the thing is, because the Glazers were distant owners and not he, Ferguson wasn't putting heads with the, with the owners as he had been his whole career, he really appreciated the autonomy and the control that he had. It was basically him and David Gill, were, since the Glazers came in, who were just left at peace to run the football club. Now, obviously, I mean, it's not the reason... The, it's not as if the the, the anti-Glazer movement wasn't strong. Obviously, 2010, we were in the midst of winning three Premier League titles. We were in the midst of being in three out of four Champions League finals. So it's, it's something that pisses me off, pisses off a lot of United fans. It's like people always say that the Glazer talk comes up when United aren't doing well. But as 2010 shows, as 2005 shows, it's just not it's just not the case. It's, it's always been at the core for United fans anyway. Yeah. And... Sir Alex's silence on the whole situation was quite uh, quite deafening, really, uh, for, for United fans. And a lot of United fans haven't sort of forgiven and forgotten Fergie for that. But with the European Super League that came out, Fergie publicly criticised, probably for the first time, uh, the whole concept of what they were doing. Uh, he was explaining how that move away from the idea of a, a league that you get locked into with no promotion, it's like it goes away from what he had worked so hard for. Yeah. Do you think, um, do, you, do you feel there's any reason now why Fergie would still sit in the, and remain silent on everything that's going on with Woodward and the Glazers? Is, why, why can't he come out? Because if Fergie was to come out now and speak, it would give so much value to the, to the anti-Glazer movement. Uh, from, from, uh, from people you've spoken to and everything that's going on, what does Fergie think of the Glazers now? Has that changed over time? And Woodward, of course, but he's he's pissed off now, so we don't really need to, don't need to speak about that. He he hasn't had a big problem with the Glazer ownership, apart from the fact that they have continuously made bad footballing decisions. Alex's Alex's feeling is this. He had control of the football club. And if he asked the Glazers for money for players, they were happy to release the money. They were happy to let him be the boss he was, which was competing for titles, European and domestically, every single year. Um, so he, he was happy with that. What really, the first shock that came to him was one day he was sitting in his office. He had already um, decided to retire. He was retiring at the end of the season. It was the February of 2013 knock on the office door, in walks Ed Woodward. And Ed Woodward tells him that, Alex, I have been chosen to replace David Gale. Now, Fergie was really surprised at this because it was 
the ultimate football role at the football club had been given to somebody who had been massively successful at the football club, but successful in a different realm. He, 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 was, he was a corporate man, Ed Woodward, mm. being given the, the football role at Manchester United. Um, so that was the big shock. What happened was he had hoped then, Alex, that David Moyes, who had already chosen to replace him, and Ed Woodward would form a great relationship like he and David Gill had, and they'd be able to run the football side of it, you know, with this great partnership. But then, of course, 10 months later, Myers gets sacked without any input from Alex Ferguson or David Gill or the old school, even Bobby Charlton at Manchester United at the time, because Alex Ferguson wasn't replaced by David Myers. Alex Ferguson was replaced by Ed Woodward. He was the one who took control of Manchester United. Then, of course, he decides he's going to hire Van Gaal, the, the, high, the best manager he could find with the best CV. So he brings in Van Gaal. Then he finds another one with a better CV, brings in Mourinho. All the time, he spent, he spent 1.1 billion on players. And when you think of the players, Schweinsteiger, Di Maria, Falcao, Ibrahimovic, the, the, Sanchez, the players that were coming and gone from the football club, just come, he was playing... Ed Woodward was playing fantasy manager. Yeah. As CEO and he was, of Manchester United. And he was crap at it. He was crap at it. And Some people was... can be good at fantasy manager, but he was not one of them. <laughs> but um, you, you were there speaking. I'll tell you what, one, one of the sentences that maybe just take a step back when I was reading the book, it's like, yeah, is that Fergie was replaced by Moyes and Gill was replaced by Woodward. And it's like, it's like, the, worst, it's like the worst sentence in the world. <laughs> when you read it back again as a United fan, you're like, Jesus, that is, su- yeah. that is such a drop off. That is so significant. It's like two yeah. cliffs at once. It's horrendous. Yeah. But um, you, were, you in your book, you speak about how Fergie sat Woodward down and sort of gave him a bit of a presentation or a lecture on the uh, on the concept of uh, winning in cycles, the concept of success being sustained over a fixed period of time and the fact that you have to rebuild inside that. And Fergie was the king of it. Like two or three yeah. times, he properly rebuilt a whole squad, especially yeah. when he gets towards that 2007 8 period, and then after that as well. But he sat Woodward down and, and sort of explained it to him. But as obviously yeah. we all know, Moyes, it didn't work out. That was Fergie's attempt at, at replacing himself immediately. Um, and it was a little bit misguided from Fergie. And also, Moyes didn't help himself in sacking all the coaches and a lot of poor decisions from him. Yeah. Uh, Fergie blamed himself, as you wrote in the book, about not speaking to the players about not getting the players on side with Moyes and sort of helping the dressing room there. But you know, that's just, you can blame yourself if you want. But in the, in your book, you explained that it was actually the Van Howe sacking that it was at that point that Fergie knew, ah, uh, shit, you're not, you're not screwed here. Why, why was it at that point you felt that Fergie felt right? This is the significant switch. This is when it all goes wrong for United. It, it goes back to the fact that Ferguson worked in cycles, as you say, Sam. And when he appointed David Moyes as his successor, he fought for Moyes to be given a six-year contract. Because for him, it was Moyes. Moyes was picked because he had proven that he could turn over teams. He was, you know, he brought players through academies and he kept Everton at a certain level through sort of great purchase buying and great academy making, uh, cooking up in the academy. That was really what attracted Myers to Ferguson. He didn't want to be bringing in a big name manager from Europe who would come in for two or three years, maybe win a title or two, and then depart, which is what tends to happen to these football major football clubs these days. Um, so he wanted Myers to be there for six years to continue the cycle, which you know we can argue all day was the wrong decision um, for multiple reasons. Um, but when Myers was sacked, Ferguson was shocked. But he realized when Van Gaal was sacked that the whole ship had turned around because the Van Gaal hiring was sold to Fergie and um, Bobby Charlton and the old school at Manchester United as we're bringing in Van Gaal to train Ryan Giggs in to the manager's hot seat because Giggs was given the assistant manager's job and was told that he was going to be Manchester United manager. In fact, Van Gaal's on record as saying he was here to pass the torch on to Giggs. So Fergie believes that, oh, we're still going long-term. We still have a long-term plan here with Giggs becoming the manager. And you could argue all day that that would have been the wrong decision too. 
um, in so many yep. respects. But um, but when Van Gaal was sacked and it was the bringing in of Mourinho, well, that's when Ferguson and Gale and um, Bobby Charlton and the old school realised that, oh, we're going to be Chelsea now, aren't we? We're, we're just chopping and changing managers and buying and selling players. And we've just, we've gone from planning long term into let's plan to win the next league title as yeah. soon as we can and um well, it kind of Ferguson, to... actually sam the yeah. one word that Fer- i say i write this in the book the one word ferguson used to describe ed woodward's running of manchester united it was desperate but not desperate as in really really bad but desperate as in he was just too desperate and eager to win something quick it's exactly that you took the words yeah. out of my mouth. That was going to be my next question. There is that oh, yeah. you did you did explain uh, that that Ed Woodward was desperate, and yeah, for me, I've always looked at Ed Woodward uh, as a narcissist. And and for those who don't know what narcissist means, uh, it's somebody who's just so self obsessed by their own image and their own success that they can have tunnel vision and they can't really see what's what's good for maybe the club they work for, like Ed Woodward at Manchester United. And or the country they run. Or, or the country they run. Yeah, that's another one. <laughs> Hello, Bojo. How you doing? But, I don't know, Bojo makes me sound like I'm his friend. Boris Johnson, <laughs> if you leave it like that. But um, with Ed Woodward, if you're looking at uh, patterns, he's the, he's the link between Moyes, between Van Hal, between Mourinho, between everything, between the demise of Manchester United. Ed Woodward has been at the... People are talking about Ollie at the wheel. Yeah. He's steering the ship. And for, for a lot of United fans, there's so much scorn towards him does Fergie have that scorn does Fer- surely Fergie looks at Woodward now and goes you know what you are just you're a dick I mean, it's, I, I, I mean obviously he would do it in a much more professional sort of way but surely Fergie now looks at Woodward and goes yeah man he's he is the problem and therefore the Glazers are the problem has has that relationship changed what what does his inner circle say about that surely he, surely it has he it, Edward was would Ed Woodward was definitely the problem in uh, Alex's eyes because his desperation um, turned the whole ship around. You know, it sort of went from being a football club to being a football team all of a sudden, you know, a fantasy football team where all these great players with big name players and big name managers were circling in and out. And and, um, so that's the problem, that desperation to become almost like a Chelsea-like, just desperate and throw money at it and, and sometimes... The shit will stick. Um, so he definitely blames Woodward. But Woodward came to him when the Mourinho experiment didn't work out. So Ferguson lost all control. Uh, his last thing, piece of control really, was to hire David Myers. He didn't know Myers was going to be sacked. And it came as a shock to him. Yeah. Um, but the next time Ferguson gained some control at Manchester United was some, what's that, five years later when... Mourinho was being sacked at the end of 2018 and Woodward had to hold his hands up and say what you were telling me about long-term planning um, is obviously Shit, right. it was right. It was right. Yeah. Christ. <laughs> that um, I've been, basically, I've been throwing shit here and none of it's sticking. I, I've won a couple of tin pot titles uh, in yeah. the five or six years I've been running the football club. And I've tried to buy these players and hire these managers. What do we do now? Which is when they sat down and decided to bring in, they were going to bring in Pochettino. That's what they were going to do. And play, and give him a long-term contract like they had given Wise a long-term contract and go back to cycling through teams rather than buying teams. Yeah. And um, which is what Ferguson was the master at. And in the interim, they decided to bring in Ali Gunnar Solskjaer, which they thought was a brilliant decision um, because um, well, Mourinho had fractured relationships with the media. Solskjaer was a glue that would bring, you know, a bit of ray of sunshine back to Manchester United in the, in the six months it would take to, for them to finally hire Pochettino. Um, but then Solskjaer went on such a great run, but more so than the points that he was bringing in in that season when he was interim manager uh, for most of it. He had totally united the whole football club. Suddenly the dressing room went from being splintered from hating Mourinho. You know, there was a lot of fallouts, a lot of yeah. fallouts, even within the, the, there was cliques in the dressing room. Soja had done such a great man management job that he, he got everybody back together outside the dressing room, inside the dressing room. 
that they decided to give him a full time job. And he in give me the month now. I think it was February or March of 2019. Ed Woodward brought Ali Gunnar Solskjaer in for a meeting to discuss the handover to hopefully Pochettino, who they were hoping to get in the in the June. Yeah. But Solskjaer turned up with his laptop and asked for a projector. And he sold Ed Woodward a 90-minute meeting of what Manchester United have done wrong, what they should be doing and could be doing um, over the next few years to ensure they can go on and win, which was Ferguson's old saying, compete for multiple titles over multiple years rather than just win the next one. Let's stop being desperate and let's let's look to an actual plan. Yeah. That Woodward was so impressed with that that um, he rang for... He thought Ferguson put Solskjaer up to it, but he hadn't. And he had a meeting with Ferguson where they decided they were going to um, give him a long-term contract as permanent manager. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, I think you write in the book as well that because we all know that uh, Solskjaer, the first person he called was Mike Phelan, but that was because mm. Fergie recommended him to yeah. Solskjaer. So Fergie really sort of had his hand back in back in the club uh, goings on for the first time, as you said there, since since 2013, Moyes. really, yeah, since David Moyes, uh, and then of course um, Fergie Fergie and his brain hemorrhage, which which took which shocked everybody, which. I'm sure took Sir Alex by surprise more than anybody else. Yeah. And we all know that, thankfully, he came round because uh, the man that he is. Uh, and I remember that day at Old Trafford. Not that I was there. I don't think I was. I might have been. I can't remember. No, I wasn't. I know. Um, <laughs> but Fergie came back and uh, it was incredible. It was an incredible emotional atmosphere. Yeah. And for, how, how did... How how tough was it for for Sir Alex, for Kathy, for for his family behind the scenes, for for a man that's been the the warrior and the leader for his entire life to all of a sudden be bed bound after a brain hemorrhage? Yeah, it, it was it was a very scary time. the The weird thing is, it actually came in waves. He had the brain hemorrhage on a, a it was a Saturday morning. He was lying in bed. He wasn't feeling good. Um. His son, Jason's film, by the way, um, which came out in May, yeah, uh, paints a good portrait um, of the recovery. But um, what happened, that, what actually happened was Saturday morning, he wasn't feeling great, stepped out of bed, collapsed. He fell onto a shoe rack. And it was the noise of the shoe rack that alerted Cathy. Uh, if she hadn't have run upstairs, uh, it's, it's very likely he'd, he'd, he'd still be with us, actually. He had a bleed on the brain. They got him to hospital. Jason and Cathy went with him. Jason is Fergie's closest son. I guess he's sort of his manager and his, his, his agent. He manages his affairs. Okay. And so, that, so they're sort of, they're like that. Um, and a, a brain surgeon, Joshy George, managed to um, perform a miracle in a way that he didn't have to remove any tissue from Alex's brain. He had a, it went in for emergency surgery at about three p.m. that Saturday, um, where they just a, applied lots of pressure and managed to sustain the whole of the brain. Didn't have to take anything from it. So m- most people who have a brain hemorrhage, like uh, Sir Alex had, would not make the recovery he made. It, 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 um, one and two are likely to die. In fact, there was there was five ba- brain hemorrhages in the hospital on the day Sir Alex had his, and the same hospital in Manchester. And two people died of the five. I, I remember reading that in the book, and I was like, "Jesus, five brain hemorrhages in the same day!" And it's like, and there's a lot of humans, I suppose. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of humans. But no, yeah. Fergie's, yeah, Fergie's recovery there was uh, was, well, yeah, it was nothing short of a miracle, really, at his mm. age and, and and what he did. And as you go on to explain, Fergie then had to spend probably the majority. Was it 2019 that happened? 18, 2018, May. 2018. So his recovery year was 2019. Yeah. There are thereabouts. And of course, it sort of crossed over towards the pandemic. And mm. he, he had to spend basically like a year sort of keeping to himself in his house, getting his strength back up before he came back to Old Trafford. And obviously, he's back in the public eye. And then he's like, great, I can go. We can go back to New York. He, he was talking about the holidays he wanted to do with Kathy. And then all of a sudden, the fucking pandemic happens. He's like, oh. yeah. He's like, you're kidding me. Like, seriously, mm-hmm. you're kidding me. Yeah, and such a shame. Obviously, for him now, that's delayed everything. So he's lost, well, looking like two two to three years of 
what he wanted to finally do uh, after he retired. Yeah. Uh, as far as you know, having having spoken to you know Albert Morgan, as I said, other people inside his inner circle. How involved do you see Fergie being from from this point after the hemorrhage onwards? Do do you really feel like he's properly just going to be that man who sits in the stands, enjoys the football game, maybe has a glass of wine and goes home and does nothing else? Or do you think he'll still be on the end of the phone if Manchester United need him? Um, my my problem with answering that is I did so much sort of probing and and getting interviews up until November of this year. So quite what Ferg, what role Ferguson played with Ranick, I'm not entirely sure. Apart from the fact that I think it's he'd definitely be on side for you know his long term Pochettino appointment in July. Um, and that's even at a guess because I haven't really asked anybody about that. So I'm not right. sure what his thoughts on the Ranić and the current situation is and whether he does have control anymore and what happens beyond. Because I suppose there, yeah, as, as you said, and as we all know, Pochettino has been the name that's been on top of our list like three times. Somehow we haven't managed to appoint him at any of those times because, yeah. I don't know, it didn't work out at PSG or it wasn't the right time because it was mid-season, blah, blah, blah. And then we were at Mourinho instead. Probably the Mourinho one was the was the most likely time where I think it could have and probably should have happened, but it didn't. And for a lot of United fans, we're looking at it now going, it, is now really the right time to bring Poch in and, and, and maybe start a cycle that we thought we were going to start like four years ago? It's yeah. it's it's all a bit odd. It's all a bit messy. But um, now I'll tell you what. Thanks for thanks for sort of having this chat today because I think it's really important for United fans to to understand uh, the Ceratic, Ceratics' relationship with the Glazers, how it started, why United fans have that disdain towards Fergie for remaining silent. Because for United fans, what the Glazers were doing in their takeover and leveraging the debt on the club was was like a dagger in the heart of Manchester United. But as far as he was concerned as the boss, he was able to do his job maybe even better than he could have done before, even if United as as an institution, as a football club, were being damaged because of it. It's a bit yeah. of um it's a tough situation that for United fans to take, I think. But Fergie was still I, so successful, right? Yeah, what what's interesting about that is I think Alex's feeling is that with regards to ownership, United have become so valuable. Like you were much more valuable than their rivals, and I make some comparisons in the book. Um, that there was only very few people on the planet that would have been able to buy them. Certainly, anybody who could have been could possibly have been able to buy them without saddling some sort of debt against it. That I think if something like a state, you know, the way a state owns yeah. PSG and a state owns uh, Manchester City. Somebody like that would have obviously wanted to interfere in football matters. So the fact that Ferguson had bosses that didn't interfere in football matters was was really the reason that, you know, it was control with Ferguson. With the, Glazers, a, the Glazers allowed him to have control, so he was fine with it. I've, to go back here, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this one, because I don't know, but just off the top of my head here, um, was David Gill always planning to leave in the same year that Fergie retired or did he announce it because Fergie retired? It was just a coincidence that they both went at the same time. Well, truth is Ferguson was going to retire the year before. Yeah. Um, so he was going to retire at 70 and he had sort of always mentioned that. Funny enough, they were always sort of rounded years. He was supposed to retire when he was 60, then he was going to retire when he was 65. And then he always said he was going to retire at 70, even though he was never telling anybody when he was retiring because it was one year rolling contracts. Yeah, he was going on. Um, he really felt that his last team was the best team he had. Ferguson's. I know a lot. Of, I know a lot of United fans wouldn't Come on, agree. Sir Alex. Let's wouldn't not be agree silly. with that. He thought he was building teams, had been building teams that could compete, could constantly compete for Premier League and Champions League at the, the latter stages. But his la and he had done. He had he'd, he'd done really well. Um, I think he'd won in his last seven years, he won five league titles and was in three Champions League finals. And the two titles that he didn't win, they lost on the last day of, of both seasons, one with the last kick of the game. Um, so his last team, he felt, was the strongest, even though reputably now, in hindsight, it doesn't look like it was. Um, but he thought they were going to win the Champions League. He got knocked out in the group stages in 2012 and he thought one more year. 
And that's why he stayed till 2013, till he was 71. But and so we... Gil, Gil leaving a year after him, um, it wasn't supposed to happen at the same time. Wow. And then obviously Nanny happened the year after, and that was Mourinho. I remember that. That stung. That stung so bad. Yeah. But anyway, let's, let's, not, let's not focus on that. But look, if, if you get the chance, um, I'll leave a link in the description for this. Uh, it's, it's a, I've read a couple of chapters. I'll read the rest now. It really is quite fascinating. I'd like to know a bit more about the man behind United's most successful period and probably our most successful period ever because it's something you write in the book. You know, we're all desperate for success to come back to United, but in reality, it's only happened in two major periods in, in United's history, and that was yeah. under two really long-term managers. So if we're looking at how United have been successful, we need to get back to that long-term well, planning. People are always asking, what's the Manchester United way? That, in truth, is the Manchester United way. Because it, that, United have only have been successful twice. It, and, but uh, there have been two real long periods. That, that for me, is it's something that you wrote that, because I've found for so long, often in the last like maybe month or two of Solskjaer's reign, when I was still supporting him, it was very hard to vocalise why I was supporting Solskjaer, but yeah, what you've written down there is exactly that. It's 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 that opposite mentality of Ed Woodward's fantasy. Fuck this, I want to win it this season. I don't care if in four years we're in complete tatters because I've got that one title. Whereas in yeah. reality, Manchester United, what we all want is over that five year period to be competitive in, in three or four of those seasons. Yeah, uh, and now, that's Solskjaer has done a good job in terms in the background at Manchester United in the undergrowth, the youth teams. He he he. He's taken in like 13 or 14 of the most wanted teenagers in world football from mm. under the nose of Manchester City, Barcelona, from Liverpool. He's taken players, you know, all the top players, the top player in Italy, uh, Facundo Palestri, that who everybody wanted. He managed to get in. I'm a Diallo. He, he's done a good job in the underbelly. It's just his first team performances were way too inconsistent. He couldn't maintain a, a run, a good, consistent run in the first team while trying to plan for the long term underneath. But the belly at United is good. It's strong at the moment, I think. But they gotta get the next appointment right. They do. They absolutely do. And uh so as you explained there, if Fergie did have his way still, then it would definitely be Pochettino, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well but... if Fergie has his way, David Myers will still be Manchester United <laughs> manager. <laughs> All right, let's end the interview on that one. I was just I want to go and throw up. I want to go and throw up. But no, David, I appreciate your time today, man. It's been really good chatting to you. Maybe we can chat again in the future. Um, Please, Sam, if, yeah. anybody, if anybody would like to buy it, I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, to, I'm guessing it's on Amazon, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah, on Amazon. Yeah, Alex, the man behind the legend. Yes, thanks very much. No problems, man. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate your time today. I hope, I don't know what I hope. I hope the next appointment's right and maybe there's going to be a book written by you in 30 years' time about Ten Hag with the same cover about his success at United, right? Yes. Yeah, he, he, you know, he, he has a genuine chance now that that Ranić is part of the decision making. I think probably puts Ten Hag as favourite. I hope so. I mean, I, I I really can see him being the man that sort of leads that long term five year for the first time in a long time. I think the club's actually been in a in a position where behind the scenes the manager will get the sort of support he needs. Whereas previously, it's been every manager fighting against what the club is trying to do. If you know what I mean? Yeah, I. I... I think um, they've learned, they have had to, if they haven't, Sam, Jesus, but they have had to have learned from their mistakes. They have well, to. You think, you'd think so, right? You would think so. You'd think so. Let's hope so. But anyway, David, appreciate your time, buddy. Uh, appreciate your time. Very much. Pleasure, Sam. Thank you.